you that you'll speak to him mightily in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you, James, for that prayer. Thank you, everybody, for the, the love of God that's in this room this evening. Um, real sense of God's presence in the midst of us today. Um, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Ron. God bless you, man. Um, I'm, uh, I'm excited to be here today to get into the word of God with you all. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, just briefly, I guess, as an introduction, um, my name's Errol Lawson. I'm from Birmingham, born and raised in Birmingham. I um, actually lived, my, the first house that I remember living in was directly across the road from Broadway School in Perry Bar, 161 the Broadway. And we actually grew up there uh, with my mom and dad and family and um, became a Christian back in 2004 and uh, became a, a minister, youth minister, um, around 2007 at Mount Zion Church in Aston in Birmingham, it was then called Aston Christian Centre, uh, Assemblies of God Church, became an ordained AOG minister, and I now lead a church plant in Harborn in Birmingham with my wife and a wonderful group of people who just love God and are just serving God together. So um, that's that's me in a, in, a, in a very brief nutshell, but let's get into the word of God, shall we? Um, I thought it'd be good just, uh, I'm not sure how you normally do things. I don't hope you don't mind me reading from the King James Bible. If there's, an, if there's another version of the Bible you prefer, please let me know. Um, is King James okay, guys? Absolutely. That's fine yeah. for us. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so we're going to read from, uh, I thought I'd read through the chapter first, read through Acts chapter 10, first of all, um, just watch through and then go through almost verse by verse, depending on how much time we have and we'll see how we go. Um, so Acts chapter 10 is our focal scripture today. So I read through. And there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spoke to Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. Wherein were all manner of four footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, no, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, that called not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate, and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. And while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius, and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. 
What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house, and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them. And he called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with them, he went in and found that many were come together. Many that were come together. And he said unto them, Ye know that it is unlawful for, uh, an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I went, I was sent for. I asked therefore, for what intent ye have sent for me? And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thy arms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send up therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that, that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness, is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee, after the baptism John preached, which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not, not to all the people, but to witnesses, unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that, is, that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and dead. To, give him, to, give, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. And while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. And they have the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as, as came with Peter, because that under Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Amen. 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 I'd like us to just begin today with our sort of a exposition of, our, of Acts chapter 10 with just a bit of context setting. Um, just to consider for a moment the, the stature of the man Peter that we're we're hearing Arvind, who is speaking to us majorly um, in this chapter. I know you, you all studied Acts chapter 9 last week. It's worth just 
bringing some context to how we've arrived at this point to bring us back just just to our memory that in the previous chapter peter at the ends with peter performing two miracles two quite significant miracles we know that he is a very unique man he's the man that was left the responsibility if you like the care of the church jesus said upon this rock will i build my church you can call him the first pastor if you like of the christian church and he has this experience where he he sees Aeneas, this man who's bedridden for eight years you you know the story and he says to Aeneas, he says to Aeneas, get up rise up and take up your mat and the response is well it's magnificent it's supernatural this man rises up from his condition of eight years and begins to walk. And there's a sense that, G, that Peter is almost continuing the ministry that has been modeled to him by his Lord. He has a deep sense of faith in God, in his ability, in the power, in the name of Jesus. He's not concerned with testifying of himself or who he, who he is or this very ordinary man. As a confidence in the Christ, he feels the, 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 the authority and the boldness to say to this man, get up. Get up. It's impossible to say to anybody to, to get up if you don't know that Christ is risen. And he knows that Christ is risen. And this gives him this confidence. If that wasn't enough, he, you know, the second miracle with Tabitha. He was raised from the dead. Indisputable indisputable his faith again is demonstrated and he's doing merely what christ has done before him but on this occasion he overcomes death literally overcomes death and as we read this chapter and we marvel at the work of god through this very ordinary man it almost begs the question what greater problem could this man possibly face I mean he's, he's now overcome death what what more difficult challenge could he engage uh, encounter on his ministerial journey well then we get to acts chapter 10 and we find perhaps an even bigger challenge at least an equal challenge that meets him in this chapter and the challenge is is prejudice it's prejudice when we look in the first in the opening verses of the chapter there's a certain man in this area called cornelius a centurion of the band called the italian band a centurion is a is a sergeant major a sergeant over a hundred men if you like he's is someone that is respected he said someone that is has a, a place of honor in the society a devout man and one that feared god with all his house with, with which gave much alms to the people and prayed to god always fascinating this man wasn't a christian but he he feared god and he prayed to god and he was generous with his possessions it's not often you find somebody who's a this is a man of war right he's a a soldier with these kind of characteristics. Here he is. And so, although he has this intimacy, or this, this, this uh, a sense of a, a connection with God, he doesn't yet know God. He's not yet in relationship with God. And, and we can all relate to knowing good people who are generous. Many who he, even have a sense of a reverence for God. But it's not enough for them to be saved. It's not enough to be saved. And so Peter is carrying in him this sense of prejudice. He's, he's raised as a Jew. He's, he believes in all of his heart there are certain things that you just don't do. I mean, most of us can relate. Uh, in Jewish households in particular, any animals with hooves uh, or that chewed the cud or were, were unclean. There were, there were certain people that you just didn't, you, didn't, you didn't relate to. You didn't talk to. It was just how they were raised. It was just... The way things were. Prejudice was part of their upbringing. And it's far harder, folks, for us to, to unlearn something than it is to learn it. He had been raised a Jew and taught some very, very deep divisions 
in things like food, in things like uh, animals and people. And so if Peter was ever going to communicate the gospel effectively, if the, if the gospel was ever going to go anywhere, it was crucial that he would unlearn these prejudices so he could connect with, engage with the communities that were surrounding him where God was calling him to go. He had to go from thinking that God's people were Jews only to believing and knowing that God could touch anybody. And so God uses this man Cornelius to, to, to bring him into this understanding. Now, like I said, he wasn't a Jew. He wasn't a Gentile, but he believed and feared God. A good man. And so one thing, although he wasn't saved, Cornelius, his fear of God and the fact that he was a good man seems to have, as you read scripture here, it tells us that this gate was enough for at least God, for, for at least for him to have a connection with God, that God could speak to him. I'd even present that a prerequisite at the very least to, to, for us to hear the voice of God is having a fear of God. And because of his fear of God, his prayers, he's making prayers. God speaks to him. And Cornelius responds immediately. He says he saw in a vision evidently, verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is this, Lord? And he said unto him, thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. Wow. Wow. I think it's amazing that even be, the, just the grace of God, the love of God, that he sees the hearts of men, even before they come into relationship through Christ. He sees and he understands the hearts of men. He's able to speak to those who don't know him. I think it's amazing. And so Cornelius obeys and he responds. And he says, Send to Joppa, call for Simon whose surname is Peter. He lodges with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. And on the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh to the city, Peter went up unto a house top to pray about the sixth hour. Now Peter's hungry. He's tired. And he falls into a trance. The Bible says. And in the trance. He, he sees this vision. Of the animals. The, the unclean animals. As far as he's concerned. These things are, are unclean. I, I shouldn't go near them. The, the, you know. And he's, there's a sense of disdain. But he hears the voice say to him. Rise. Now Peter is being told to rise. Could it have been that Peter was in a, in a certain spiritually dead state, unawares? And now God is saying to him, Christ is saying to him, rise. Rise out of what you thought was right. Rise out of what your preconceptions were, your prejudices were. Rise to a new reality, a new understanding, a new way of seeing things. Rise, Peter. Kill and eat. And Peter, in his stubbornness, he argues, doesn't he? He resists three times. Three times. No, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. I know best. I, I know best. And it's such that the, 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 prejudice, the prejudices in his heart, the, 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 the fortress that has been formed in his, his mindset, a stronghold, you might call it, of a belief system that has told him that there's only one way of living and there's only one way of expressing his faith. No, 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 it's not possible. There's, there's no way outside of this. Three times he denies. But we see the Holy Spirit move on him. 
The Holy Spirit moves on Peter in such a way that it appears he's shaken out of his trance and he's, he's, he's in this kind of sense of, of shock almost that what just happened? What did I just see? What is the Lord saying to me? And he goes down and he sees the men waiting for him downstairs. And he says, behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause? Wherefore ye are come, verse 21. And they say Cornelius, a centurion, a just man, and one who feareth God. The reputation of Cornelius is, is so pr profound. He's not a Christian. He's not a Jew. He's not a Gentile. But he fears God. And this fear of God is sufficient to get him to this point. A man of good report among all the nation of the Jews was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear the words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea and Cornelius waited for them and he called together his kinsmen and his near friends. Now, as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up and said, no, 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 no. I am just a man like you. And this is so important. Peter knows in himself who he really is. God has brought Peter through a process of bringing him to a place of humility, recognising his own failings, his own weaknesses, his own flaws, the, the real depth of his character and personality. He knows himself in an acute way. And, and the last thing he wants is for any man to be reverencing him. New Christians today, new to the faith, will have reverence for preachers and leaders in, in just in the just fresh kind of awe that we can have, you know. And uh, Peter says, no, 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 no. I am just a man. Would you stand to your feet, man? Stand to your feet. And as he talked with him, he went in and found that many were come together. It seemed like a bit of a Holy Ghost setup, if you like. It's a gathering of people. Peter's still unsure what is going on. And he said unto them, Ye know how that this is unlawful, that a man that is a Jew to, should keep company. For a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me I should not call any man common or unclean. In the process of the journey from the rooftop to the house to the front door, the revelation has become clear to Peter that the animals he saw, the vision he saw, wasn't about animals, that it was about people. It was about people. That he should not call any man common or unclean. And therefore came I unto you without gain, saying, as soon as I was sent for, I asked therefore for, for what intent ye have sent for me. And Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. At the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, excuse me, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard. And thine arms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call hither to Simon whose surname is Peter. He's lodged in the house of one Simon Atana by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, all we are, all, are we all here present before God to hear all the things that God commanded thee. I hear this verse here almost... Is a sermon in itself. Verse 34. Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth. I perceive that God has, is no respecter of persons. Another version says that God has no favorites. And this may be one of the biggest challenges that we face today. In society, prejudice. God is no respecter of persons he has no favorites but every newspaper that we, re we read today every every news item every paper we read everything we look at is there's prejudice everywhere everywhere if it's not black against white it's 
rich against poor. It's this culture versus that culture. It's left versus right. It's prejudice. Lying behind so much of our division in society, division in our churches, dare I say, wars, protests, is this prejudice? And so it begs a question, what is the cure? Well, here is the cure. Jesus Christ is the cure. God has no favorites. Christ is all in all. And so Peter, his, literally his, his whole paradigm has shifted in this journey. God has used Cornelius and this whole encounter to bring about a transformation in his life that will change the whole course of his ministry. And I pray for us that God will give us such a revelation of his truth and of his grace that will change the course of our ministries. I, I meet with so many pastors and leaders and, and just even last week training some pastors on the subject of multi-ethnic churches and, and talking about what it would take. How, how, do we, how do we reach communities that don't look like us and, and have the same background as us? And how do we get the gospel to, to other parts of the community and society? And, and how do we, I, I, I present today, we, we need a change of heart. We need a change of heart. We need a, a work of the Holy Spirit to take place in our lives as, as individuals and of leaders that would see that God truly is no respect to our persons. None at all. And so in verse 35, he says, In every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. In every nation. Hallelujah. Prejudice, on the other hand, says the opposite. Prejudice says, he that fears men and does what is, what is expedient is worthy of exaltation. No. That's not the path that we know as Christians. In every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted by him. Now, this is good. And this is how Cornelius has gotten to this point. Because Cornelius fears God. Cornelius is working righteous. He's, he's been doing good. He's a, he's a do-gooder. He's doing right. He's living a straight life. But this is not enough to get Cornelius to heaven. And folks, it's not enough that we do good deeds. It's not enough that we live a good life, that we live right. We live right. We live a right, straight life. It's not enough to make heaven. There's a, uh, in fact, you know, there's, there's so much more. We'll go into it here. You see, we have to ask ourselves, where do we draw the line between God's people and others? It's a big question, I believe, that God is asking in this scripture. Where do we draw the line between God's people and others? When God sees the heart of this man, Cornelius, who's not a churchgoer, he probably had some other habits and other things that he did on the side that we probably consider unchristian even. Many of our, many of our visions are too narrow at times. Our vision of who God's people are is based on, you know, our group or our denomination or our color or God sees far wider than we do. And he accepts, he says here in verse 35, he says, first of all, he accepts number one, those who fear him, those who fear God, those who fear God, have a healthy fear of God. And there is, there is a healthy fear. You know, if my children are crossing the road and there's cars coming, I want them to have a fear. I want them to have a healthy fear of danger. Or if there's a fire blazing somewhere, it's, it's right to have a, a healthy fear. And the, begin, the beginning of a man's dealing with God is a healthy fear of God. A reverential fear of God, a fear of displeasing him by doing wrong. And Peter says here, he that feareth him, number one. Number two, he that is righteous. 
or worketh righteousness, he who does what is right, he, you know, it's not enough to fear God and to live anyhow. It's a standard by which God expects us to live. It's a, a standard of righteous living, if you like. That is expected as a, as a child of God. It matters how we live. Again, these things don't save a man. They don't save a man. But then he goes on to explain in verse 36. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, Lord of all. He's beginning his sermon here to them. And a powerful sermon it is. He says, you need peace, Cornelius. And peace can only be found through Jesus Christ. You can have the fear of God and you can be living right, but without peace, so you have nothing. You can have both those other two and be very incomplete. You can be a person living who's doing good deeds, who appears to live a very straight life, but still not have peace in your life. But peace comes to you, Cornelius, through Jesus Christ. It's through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. There's no peace otherwise, folks. There's no peace otherwise. Even if he lives a good life. Oh, glory to God. Fearing God, having God is one thing. But we need the Son. And we also need the Holy Spirit. We have peace through the Son. But we have power through the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. In verse 37, he says, that word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Hallelujah. Who went about doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him i can imagine the crowd sat here many of them good people and hearing for the first time this truth this message of christ and something is beginning to bubble up on the inside of them there's something in them beginning to stir they can sense something moving on them they've never heard this before there's something called peace that it surpasses what we are currently experiencing there's something called power What's his power? And Paul Peter preaches this very simple, perfect summary of the gospel. He says the gospel is good news, folks. It's not good advice. It's good news. I'm giving you good news, people. And this good news will change your life. He doesn't talk about church. He doesn't talk about himself. He, he simply preaches Jesus Christ. And he preaches nothing but facts, all facts. Nothing contested, nothing to be argued with, just facts. He says, number one, God anointed him with the Holy Ghost, with power. He went about doing good. He healed all that were oppressed of the devil. He defeated the devil. He defeated the powers of darkness. Hallelujah. He said he was put to death on the cross. And God raised him up the third day. He rose again. And as he's speaking, as he's teaching the people, the spirit of God is harboring on them. And all the people, sorry, and God raised him up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people. And to testify that it is which he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive the remission of sins. Hallelujah. Here they realized for the first time that there was something called forgiveness that was available to them. And this is the gospel. That our sins will be forgiven. And they're hearing today that their sins would be wiped away, blotted out, not held against them. 
Nothing that anyone else could do for them. No, no one else could do this for them. There's nothing they could produce. There, none of their works, their conscience would still be bothering them. But here is freedom. Here is deliverance. Here is love. Your sins will be forgiven if you believe on his name. And while Peter spoke these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. Praise the Lord. Just picture the moment. They're all gathered. And the revelation, they're hungry, they're thirsty, they're longing for this word from God. And they receive it wholeheartedly. All to receive the word of God wholeheartedly. To receive it into our souls. That we might be healed and be delivered and be set free. They receive the word of God with their whole hearts. And they, and while he had spake these words, the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Speaking in tongues is so important, so key, so powerful. But it's even more glorious in one sense that they began to worship God. All of them extolling the Lord, blessing his name. Grateful, grateful. Do you remember those days when you first came to Christ when he found you? And you felt that sense of salvation. It's so important. I think it was Spurgeon said that the gospel that saved you is the gospel that you'll need that will, will preserve you through life. Here is the truth of the gospel. And they've received it almost from the horse's mouth, one could say, from Peter. And they've received it so deeply and surely into their hearts that their immediate response is to worship him and they are baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the church begins to grow and expand. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him. They begged him, in other words, to stay longer. Don't go, Peter, they said. Don't go, don't go. Stay with us. Stay with us longer. We want to hear more about this Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to pray this evening if you would allow us to pray for a moment. Oh, that fresh fire from heaven. That fresh fire of the Holy Ghost. That will fill us afresh today. A fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. Oh, that our hearts will be transformed. That we see beyond any kind of barrier, any kind of prejudice, any kind of wall that may have been placed up, in, placed in our hearts between us and anybody else who may be different from us in any way. That God might fill us afresh and use us to reach beyond any type of barrier or line that many might come to Christ. So, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray tonight. I pray for all of us here, Lord, as we read your word and we see your grace manifested, that you would help us, oh God. You fill us afresh tonight with your presence and with your power. Give us a fresh perspective, oh God. Give us, renew our hearts, Lord God. Give us soft hearts, Lord God, to those that are not like us or not from our backgrounds, our, our social groups, our our environments, our postcodes, Lord. Give us a fresh love, I pray, Lord, a fresh heart and a fresh desire to connect with others, and other communities in our city, in our region, in our nation, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. God bless you guys. God bless you. I am back over to Magnus.